why do we want information from mixers? This is a typical report from any crime lab. It happens to be from our county. Here's a swab from a handgun. Many crime labs just can't say anything at all about handguns. They usually are mixers of three, four, five, or six people may have touched that handgun. They're a complex, low-level mixture. So what they can say is, we processed it, we generated the data, and no conclusion can be made. So this was an interesting case. I won't go into the details, but there was two gangs shooting at each other, and there was a policeman nearby, and just a lot of stuff was going on. And so they arrested some people. And the question is, what do you do at trial if you don't have any DNA evidence? Very hard to know. Who do you bring charges against? Who do you drop charges against? Well, in this case, we are actually asked to analyze the DNA on the handgun. We separated the DNA into four contributors and their genotypes. One of those contributors it was a match to one of the suspects, and another person who was exclusionary. So the person who was excluded, they dropped charges against which not only was a fair result, but also saved money for trial. And then you also had so the person who was included pled guilty. So again, you had a fair outcome based on evidence that otherwise wouldn't have existed without an accurate computer analysis, which is typically the case. People just go to trial without the DNA evidence because you don't have it. It's inconclusive in most cases when there are mixtures. To date, in Allegheny County, Cybergenetics has processed almost 60 cases. There have been 13 trials with testimony. There was one on Friday I testified in. What we do is we analyze the cases at no cost, anyone who sends them to us, and we let people know what the information is. And then they can decide afterwards, do they want to use it or not? In this case, the prosecutor said, I can't use the information. Being ethical, he ended our email report over to the defense who said, I could use that information. And so this was the first case in Allegheny County where I've testified for the defense. It was a very nice presentation to the jury because neither side was attacking the science or the expert. It was just about what's the DNA saying. It's not that common, but it was sort of laid back. These are usually serious cases, rapes, homicides, handgun possessions, incest rapes. They're pretty nasty crimes. And the outcome in more than half the cases is a guilty plea once the DNA is back in the case, avoiding the time and cost of going to court if you already have evidence that tilts one way. We had offered to the county to do all their DNA for free and set up a database. The thinking on this was address the handgun epidemic. So create a database where all DNA was analyzed, all handguns were, actually everything could be compared with everything, including handguns, to tie together crime scenes. And it was reported in the paper, it was after a CLE legal education program I'd, I'd given at the county. And it never happened because even though the prosecutors liked it and evidently the public defender was okay with it and the judges liked it, the crime lab didn't seem to want to have their data looked at by an outside entity on a regular basis. After a year and a half of trying to persuade them, the DA's office gave up. But uh, there are other crime labs that have our technology that are doing these kinds of activities where they're linking property crime to sexual assaults and so on, and solving crime by using a database based on modern genotypes instead of the database we currently have from the FBI, where over 90% of the mixtures are never uploaded to the database because it was designed for simple DNA from one person, and it doesn't work very well with mixtures. So all that data is not being used as information. I want to tell you about one more case, because true allele is not only used for helping to convict the guilty, it's also used to help exonerate the innocent. Daryl Pinkins was a man in Indiana who, in 1989, was misidentified with two of his co-workers for a terrible series of crimes that were happening in northwest Indiana. It was a gang of five men driving around, and they would bump somebody on the highway, and then they would rob them. And then it escalated to beating them. Then it escalated to raping, robbing, and beating them. So the police were anxious to get somebody. And Daryl Pinkins and two others were misidentified through uniforms that had been stolen by the actual perpetrators. 
were still unidentified, and wrongfully convicted, and Daryl Pinkins and his co-defendant, Roosevelt Flynn, were sentenced. Roosevelt Flynn wrote a book about his experience called Innocent Nightmare, and he got out after 17 years, but Daryl Pinkins was still in jail. And this is the story of the DNA evidence. In 2001, DNA evidence was generated by a private laboratory. And based on that evidence, there was a jacket and a sweater. There were two easy DNA items, major contributors. You could see the peaks, and the crime lab said, there's two people in here, we have them. Now, interestingly, the post-conviction court, when Daryl Pinkins went to overturn his conviction, said, we're not impressed by having DNA from two other people, because there are five assailants, and there's three of you guys, and two DNA profiles, five equals five, you can all stay in jail. Which nowadays might not be considered terribly fair, but that's what happened. And so he stayed in jail, serving out a 65-year sentence. An innocent group, the Wrongful Conviction Clinic in Indiana, approached us 15 years after this data was created, and we got the same data that the DNA laboratory had. And we did at least five things with that data that computers can do that crime labs generally can't. We were able to compare evidence with evidence to establish who was and wasn't there and exclude Pinkins and Glenn from the evidence. We were able to calculate exclusionary match statistics, which crime labs can't do. Instead of only looking at big contributors who are maybe 75% of the DNA, we were able to pull out 5% minor contributor genotypes and make comparisons. The computer can also look at multiple DNA tests simultaneously from the same location, something people can't do. Standard in statistics, but not with people. We also are able to show statistically that three of the perpetrators that we found were brothers, and none of the accused were brothers. Essentially, we found five unidentified genotypes, which equaled the five unidentified assailants, showed the defendants were not linked to the crime, and last year, the district attorney canceled the hearing. What actually happened is I had practiced my talk in Cyril Wecht's class at Duquesne University at the law school. And as I was coming back from giving it a trial run on the law students, I got a text that the DA said he's dropping the hearing, he can just go free. And that's what happened. There was a 48 hour show about it a few months ago. And so Pinkins was exonerated a few months ago, his co-defendant Roosevelt Glenn finally got his official exoneration as well. So computing doesn't just implicate the guilty. It can also get more out of the data to show when somebody isn't in the DNA evidence. Let me wrap up with a few thoughts. Why do crime labs fail on mixtures? There are many reasons. The analysts are experts in forensic biology. They know how to work with the biological samples and the laboratory tests generating excellent data, but they're not experts in computational statistics. Most people who develop these types of analyses have PhDs in statistics, and the people who are comfortable with this typically have good backgrounds in math. They don't have to be statisticians, but they might be engineers or chemists or something more quantitative that the biologists in the lab are not. So they're being asked to go into court and be cross-examined on areas they don't really have a background in. They're very uncomfortable with it. It's starting to happen, but there's still a lot of discomfort. There are some crime labs where there's a stronger mathematical group, but that's rare. There are also strong incentives in the laboratory process for how you get your funding, how you keep your lab open, how you stay in favor with the FBI and have access to the database that they have of convicted offenders. And the focus of all those incentives is on generating data not on yielding or extracting information from that data. Nobody is grading them on how much information they get. It's not part of the process. There's also a concept of uncertainty. In court, people like being able to make statements that are definite, just short of it's him. You know, they want to be able to make some kind of statement. And if you say nothing, that avoids that fear and controversy. But in the 21st century, science and the public are much more comfortable with uncertainty. We understand that the world is made of probabilities and that math can use probabilities 
in order to get reliable results. Uncertainty isn't bad, it's just an aspect of our data that can be tamed through math and computers. Here are some recommendations I made in an article that's coming out next month, I think. I think DNA should be open to public scrutiny. The concept that it's hidden, cloistered in crime labs that can't do much with it is not a good thing. If it were open to public scrutiny, maybe they would do more with it on their own. There's been so many failures of DNA mixtures in the past. We know that there are people in jail where the DNA was misinterpreted. And we know that there are people who've been victims of crime where maybe that wasn't necessary. All DNA should be looked at. What has been done before as well as what's being now. There's a tremendous need to educate trial attorneys and judges. If you think that biological analysts are terrified of math and computers, have a chat with a defense attorney one day. I gave a course with a defense attorney, Mike Mackin, who was public defender a few years ago. This was at Duquesne half a year ago. And he said he did a survey. He opened up by saying, I called 25 of my colleagues and asked them, as a defense attorney, what do you do when you hear there's DNA against your client? And you can imagine there's two types of answers. One, explicative deleted. And the other is, how quickly can I get a plea? The concept of even engaging the evidence, understanding what it means, how it can be used to help them, or why it may not be reliable doesn't even come up. A lot of education is needed. Automating mixture interpretation by computers and getting people out of the process can eliminate bias. Most crime lab mixture interpretation is not validated. It's not scientifically tested. When it is tested, it's shown that it doesn't work. So it should be tested. Methods should stay in their limits. I've been involved in cases where a method that works very well on a lot of DNA doesn't work for a mixture, does not work for a very small amount of DNA. And validation studies had shown that. There's the computer method. And we need to go beyond laboratory limits. Just because a laboratory is comfortable doing something doesn't mean that's the best science. That's certainly what the last 20 years have proven. Toward this end, I and Dr. Rhea David, who's here, founded a nonprofit this year called Justice Through Science. And the main initial activities are going to be to reanalyze forgotten DNA evidence with help from student volunteers, looking at current and past cases. And also, we're setting up educational programs to educate lawyers and scientists and people like yourself so that people are more aware that there is a problem that almost no one even knows about, except if you're inside the field. There's a lot of information on Cybergenetics website. You can visit our website, and there's also a YouTube channel with about 50 DNA talks about different cases and topics. And much of this is for lawyers, not all technical for scientists. I think I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you very much.